I'd like to call to order um, a public informational meeting on short-term rental ordinance uh, by the Town of Woodstock Board of Village Trustees. And the purpose of this meeting largely is going to be to get input from you folks out there. Um, we have copies of the ordinance up here, so if you don't have one, please pick one up. Um, the, the full ordinance, proposed ordinance is up here, so... Uh, and sign in. And, uh, yeah, please, please sign in. For the people at home, I'd like to read a short, concise summary of what uh, the purpose is uh, of this ordinance. The purpose of the short-term rental ordinance is to regulate short-term, in other words, less than 30-day, rental of dwelling units within the village. The ordinance seeks to balance the desire of property owners to rent their residential properties to short-term rental guests for compensation against the desire of residents to pre preserve the traditional peace and quiet of their residential neighborhoods. To preserve and also to preserve and protect residential neighborhood character and livability from the nuisance impacts that are often associated with short-term rentals. Also to limit or prevent long-term rentals from being replaced with short-term rentals. Also to ensure the safety of occupants of short-term rentals and the well-being of the community. And also to promote the public health, safety, and welfare of the village, its <coughs> residents, and visitors. Among the principal provisions under the ordinance are a, short, are, are a short term rental registry and annual reporting process, regulatory requirements and prohibited activities, a waiver and variance process, and enforcement provisions, including civil penalties. The ordinance contains section headings, authority, purpose, definitions, compliance with the law, short-term rental and annual report, regulatory requirements and prohibited activities, fees, waiver variance, enforcement, waiver fees, civil penalties, other relief, severability. And the full text of the ordinance is going to be available at the town hall for any who would like to stop in and uh, take a look at it. And at this time, I would be happy to uh, recognize uh, anyone who would like to uh, make comments or have questions. Um, and I would appreciate if folks limited, um, if they hear something that is exactly what they were about to say, then don't say what has already just been said. So, any comments? Hi. Yes. Nancy Hoblin. Yes, and thank you. Please, These please are fabulous. I'm totally in favor. I, you've done a great job. I hope you do it. Do it all. Thank you, Nancy. I was, uh, Patrick Proctor, 25 Slayton Terrace. I just had a question looking at over, there's the waiver fees and the civil penalties, yes. and it seems like two different ways to collect the fines. So yes. could you just explain that briefly? Sure. If someone um, has broken the regulations, they have the option of paying the waiver fee, which is a significantly lower amount, than if they don't do that, and we have to pursue them in the civil court, send someone over to the civil court, and pursue it in that manner, which is more expensive for the village. Um, and so we're, we're allowing people to say, oh, you know what, I did, I did this, it is, it's, it's wrong, and I'm gonna pay the waiver fee. Yes. Uh, Joanna Garbish, and I live over on Mountain Avenue, and I've had the experience of being in a condominium there last year where the laws were not, or regulations were not being followed, and one of the apartments was constantly being rented out short term, and I was in the next place for the winter, and I had people coming and going all the time, and it was terrible. So I just wanted to say I'm in favor of what you're doing. Thank you. We've heard that from other folks too. It is one of our, our motivations in, in this ordinance. Uh, absolutely, it's, it's to have situations like that not happen. If you look at the if you look at the penalty fees for someone who doesn't register at all and is just going flat out, they're quite severe. Up to eight hundred dollars per day, every day is additional fee. So we're hoping this will uh, keep things like your reporting from happening. So, <laughs> Jeff, yes. how are you going to locate Scott Laws? Well, David Green 
is the primary compliance officer. And he's going to be uh, scanning the internet. And we are hoping folks like you and others will also uh, let him know when you think something's being done that is uh, against these regulations if these get approved. Um, so the combination of the two. And, and because the situation we're in in the village, I should explain, is a little different than the town, in that the, the village has a charter from 1836 that specifically allows us to regulate the use of buildings. The town does not have such a charter and must go through the, the uh, zoning process in order to regulate and enforce. It's more difficult there, especially the enforcement side, which is, tends to be in Superior Court, very expensive, lawyers, and so forth. If this gets passed, this is more similar to getting a ticket and, and, and it's treated in civil court. We send someone over, uh, whether it's David Green or a police officer, and um, to administer that. Um, so there's more teeth in this ordinance because our charter allows for that. And uh, this would be the first, according to the lawyer that uh, we've hired to help us develop this, this would be the first ordinance of its type in the state of Vermont. So, yeah, Patrick. Yeah, it, two more questions. The first one was that in section six, item J, um, it says six times during a 12 month period. And I, I was trying to look it up online, but is that the same as the current allowance? It's the same as the okay. current. What this board felt was that we were not going to restrict people from doing what they're already doing. We simply want them uh, to know who's doing it and uh, to make sure that their buildings are safe for the people they're renting to, A, and B, that they're following the regulations. Um, so we're not changing how often people can do it. If it's an owner-occupied building, then they can do it six times up to, uh, through uh, any time, less than 30 days, six times a year during the foliage period of September 15th to October 21st, they can do it an unlimited amount of time. Now, if it's a non-owner occupied building, the difference is they can do it six times a year for the same time period. They may not do it during the foliage period beyond their six times a year that they're allowed. And, and in terms of the burden of proof, it, like, like as it says here, the compliance officers can be police officers or zoning officers. It, how can, if we're, if we're kind of getting the information through observational information or through the internet or that kind of thing, can a police officer really come to somebody and say, you've been accused of breaking this ordinance without, because typically if there was something like a, a crime, a more serious crime, they'd, need, they'd have the burden of proof on the police. So how will they actually enforce this? Well, they don't enforce it through knowledge uh, that they've been renting it on their records. They've got to, for one thing, they've got to pay tax now. Um, they, they, they're already supposed to. But that's part of, part of getting the permit now. It says that they must show photographic evidence that they have state tax IDs and that they're collecting tax, like just as uh, a commercial enterprise would have to do that. Uh, bed and breakfast, for instance. Uh, this kind of levels the playing field a bit. It allows them to do it, allows them to get the income, the same that they're getting right now, the same number of times. We just want to know who's doing it. Um, I, I, I guess my concern is more like, if, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I saw my neighbor renting his apartment and over the past, 10 weeks, there have been different cars there every weekend. Well, for one thing, uh, if they notice it and they've been seeing it consistently, if they notice it while the person, the renter is there, we can send a compliance officer to talk to the Airbnb person, as an example. Okay. They say, oh yeah, we're, we're renting from Connecticut, and yeah, we're here, but we can, fine, thank you. We now know that they've exceeded the number they're allowed, and they will get a fine. Where are the gentlemen? So I think oh, sorry. Sorry, Mary. I think this is a good point. I think this is great. I think it's really good, you know, what you're doing, because I think the problem before was the way it was written. There was no way to, um, to find these people who weren't following the rules. But I think this, what 
this guy, what you're Patrick. trying to come up with, Patrick, is so is it going to rely on the public turning in their neighbor? Because it's the tough thing, because you can't go around and like police the neighborhoods for this, because sometimes you wouldn't even know if somebody was doing. So is it going to, because that's an uncomfortable thing. I think that's what I've heard before, is that maybe people weren't complaining because they didn't want to step on their neighbor's toes. I mean, I don't know what to believe. Well, it, it'll be a combination of what's observed um, there were reviews. For instance, do you know there's a B&B &B, uh, in, in um, the Optimus Center? A what? A B&B, &B, uh, not a B&B, &B, an Airbnb in the Optimus Center. Right, I knew that. In the village. It has about 47 reviews. It's been unregulated, and um, they're, they're breaking the law. I knew that. Okay, you knew that. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know I that. That just, came, that. That's just came, recently came to my attention. So that's an example of something that can be tracked, and we can contact the owner, hopefully long before they have a record good, like that, good, yeah. and say, you've got to, you know, here's the fine, yeah. and if you want to avoid that in the future, stick to the rules. Good. Now, it, it all makes sense. It's just, um, again, as long as you've got, is it, so is there somebody who is in charge, a specific person? I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't read through this whole David thing. David Green. David Green, is okay. He's our primary compliance officer and the health, and health inspector, and he has now obtained uh, the ability from the state fire department, mm -hmm. uh, fire safety division, to be um, uh, uh, someone who's able to make these inspections legally as their designee. So perfect. So that's, that's, that's a really good thing there for us. There was one other thing I did notice, um, and this is just a minor thing, where they, they, there's no garbage allowed in sight or whatever. Um, you have to understand, I think one thing you want to keep in mind is when I used to use Casella, you had, you had to bring your garbage out to the street. They don't pick it up at your door. So that might be something you might want to tweak because you do have to put your garbage out on the street. Yeah. One day a week. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's ref yeah, that, you know, that might be tweaking because I think the intention had more to do with garbage that was not contained Contain within oh, a closed container. Okay. I didn't agree with that. But it's a good job. Yes. Thank you. Good question back there. Yes. Yeah, David Nixa, 12 High Street. Yeah, um, David. I sent you my comments yes. earlier. Um, I'd just like to emphasize a couple of things. One is with regard to 6C, it seems like having people live 30 minutes away and not putting a restriction on response time is, you know, needs to be addressed because you can live 30 minutes away and not show up for a day or two days or three days. So 30 minutes seems irrelevant to me. I think it should think more about response time. So. If you're contacted to come about an issue, you need to be there within a certain period of time. How far away you live seems somewhat irrelevant um, to me. Okay. Um, secondly, I think um, it doesn't specify minimum durations, so you could theoretically have one night stays, which for those who are abutting property, and we abutted, both Nancy and I abutted a property where they were renting 35, 45 times a year, sometimes one night stays. Well, one so, night stay is and one they were licensed. It's one out of six allowed. Oh, okay, I wasn't clear about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and then um, multi unit buildings. So if you own an apartment house or six units in a building or four units in a building, can you have a short term rental on all four of them? It just seems to defeat the whole purpose of having a limitation on how many you would be able to have, sort of similar to what this um, lady said about the frequency. So theoretically, you could have four units times six. But how many of those actually exist in our village? I don't know the answer to that. I'm just saying, right. you know, would it be appropriate to consider, or you could build one. But but along those lines, there have been a number of buildings in town that have been divided into condos. So if we wanted to just like future proof for that, it might be worth mentioning. Yeah. One of the things that we definitely are going to do is um, look at this a year from now, and if we find that situations like you're describing are actually occurring, um, or like Patrick said, is uh, becoming a problem. We can amend this easily. 
that, that's good to know. Um, right, it's not, uh, not, it's not going to be an ordinance that's set in stone. It, it, it's a living ordinance that can right. be worked. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do applaud you for the comprehensiveness of this, the thoroughness of this, taking this on at such a, a detailed level. I think this is terrific. And um, I guess my final comment is, you know, notwithstanding the fact that you have identified a compliance officer, I think at some point you need to consider enforcement through a commercially available site that can actually tell you how many real units happen from time to time, not relying on the public or the compliance officer, but more on commercially available services that can actually tell you on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis how many people actually are out there. And they can then tell you, are they licensed, who is the property owner, how many times they've actually done it. That stuff is all available now, and it's not that expensive, all things considered. We, so. we, have, we, we have discussed that. And again, I think that falls under, let's let this run a year. Yeah, I understand. I'm just saying and, that. And I no, that but I'm saying you're, you're absolutely right. That may be a service that at some point we would want to avail ourselves of. But at this time, we, we didn't decide to do that. A shortfall that comes <laughs> forward in that situation that's come to light, it's not true. Be sure. So if you block it out, you it's it's, 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 it's shows it's, it's just a blocked period, and not a reserve. Period. Not a reserve period. Okay, then if that's how, if that's true, then that's great. Oh, that's something we can consider. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David. <coughs> Thank you, Carrie. Allison. So, uh, Allison Clarkson, uh, I'm really grateful to you for doing this and being the first municipality in the state to do this. As you know, our committee, Senate Economic Development, put. Uh, the rules in place and are uh, to have the, actually finally have them uh, have a tax ID and actually report their income and be taxed on it. Uh, we are now looking at the next stage of how we manage our short-term rentals in the state and so this will be very helpful as we look at this issue. Um, we have been hearing a lot about it as we've been doing our housing tour <clears throat> around the state uh, and are uh, beginning to understand the pressure short-term rentals, particularly in our downtowns, are putting on our affordable housing. So we are, uh, we're really grateful to you for doing this. And I guess I would say, uh, in terms of compliance, I think the tax department, I think one of the things I'm hearing uh, during the course of the housing tour and in this discussion is that, actually I think the tax department could be better partners with us, um, both tracking and identifying. And I think we need to work with the tax department who are always wanting to be incredibly private about uh, their information, actually sharing more information with municipalities as they try and get a handle on this issue. So um, thank you for leading the way and uh, thank you for your good work on this and uh, we also will be working on this during the course of the session. Great, thank you, thank you for that update and, uh, and that idea of working with the tax department that could yeah. end up being another useful enforcement mechanism. Thank you. Patrick. So I'd ask a few questions about this. And I just wanted to make clear uh, that I, I, I'm fully in support of this, and I think it's great. And my questions were solely intended to like kind of understand the document better. Um, but I think it's also kind of worth noting, uh, just from what you'd mentioned about not changing the permissible regulations and just kind of um, putting some teeth into it, that um, you know I know there have been some objections to this going forward, but I think it, it's really worth underscoring that this isn't changing what's permitted. It's just calling out the people who have already been breaking the ordinance for the past X number of years, you know, yeah. so. Um, it, been a, you're absolutely right, Patrick. It's important to note that there have been responsible short-term rental uh, <laughs> folks in this village who have done it right. Yes. Yes. And, and there's yeah. lots. Well, it, absolutely. And, and also more so that, you know, when this ordin the ordinance that's now in place was created, there was discussion about what the ordinance should be then, and the town decided, the village decided to have that ordinance. So this is simply because of the advent of Airbnb and VRBO and whatever else, it's been easier to break those ordinances kind of under the radar, and this is trying to kind of circumvent that. So. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Nice work, guys. Yes. Wendy Merriman, 39 Mountain Avenue. Yes, Wendy. And looking this over, I see a, an important clarification, but I just want, I appreciate this effort too. I'm in its support. Um, I want to ask clarification about how the um, foliage exception has been put in as a separate 
um, it's a little different than the standing um, let, uh, guidelines we have in that the foliage is, is now, and I think it's an important distinction that I want to make sure it's very clear, is a separate concern. It's not something that's added to um, a short-term rental set of options. I'm not sure. I okay, so the foliage, so. Because you know that you can do that now. Yes, right. but my uh, interpretation and in all this discussion has been that current short-term rental owners use that time as well. That free as a freebie. Only if they're in residence, right? But I think what you've done is important in clarifying that, and I'm happy to see that okay. because it was confusing in the word. It is confusing in the wording in the current regulations. In addition, what will change there, right, in terms of the foliage thing, I think, is the fact that people will have to register. And I think right now, especially during foliage time, there's an awful lot of rentals that go on that are so completely under the radar. We don't know if it's a, if, if they have the safety regulations that should so be. So you are asking them to register they, in the foliage they, season? They, yes. The owner-occupied. That period is only saying that they, they can rent more often. It's unlimited, but they still must register and they still must be inspected by the fire of the okay, chief. Okay, I don't know if so I got that. So all of that is still in place regardless. So sorry to be late. Yes, Sally. Oh, I see. It's just the limitation is yes. this exception, not not the permit. Correct. I miss. Thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. So, so when did you guys switch to six o'clock meetings? <laughs> well, this is not this is not okay. a regular trust totally, meeting. Totally, totally missed this. <laughs> and in fact, we will be discussing uh, Again. actually uh, yeah. uh, having no. a vote during our regular meeting. Right. So I'm, I'm just I'm just sorry that I missed it because I had it in my calendar at seven o'clock. So my question is just in terms of the the relationship with this ordinance with the current village zoning regulations. As you know, we're in the process. The planning commission right. is in the process of rewriting the village zoning regulations. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether we would. Um, suggest changes to short-term rentals um, or not, but um, certainly this is much more comprehensive than what we have in the current zoning regulations. Mm -hmm. So my question is really, how do you how do you expect this to to mesh with zoning regulations as opposed to an ordinance? Well, because you're not really referencing the zoning ordinance in here. We don't. Uh, we much. try to use a lot of similar language, right. and we also try to use um, again similar time periods that yep. were already yep. in existence yep. without knowing whether you were going to suggest changes or not right. from the planning right. commission. So the question I have then is if, if in our rewrite of the village zoning, um, it comes up that we want to make some changes, how do we then go about making any potential changes with the ordinance as you may adopt, adopt it in the near future? It's going to be for village zoning, it's going to be you know, five or six months minimum before we get to it. Right. But I, I'm just curious well, about as, that process. Well, as Terry said, this is kind of a living ordinance. Okay. Uh, and if, if uh, the Planning Commission comes up with something which yep. we like yep. and is different than what's in here, okay. we'll make it work. And what is the process then for making a change to an ordinance in terms of the timing of it? So if you want to, if you want to. Warned and then a change, right? Well, there's the, the, the ordinance, I think it's 44 days, 45 days. Okay. 44. 44, 44, 44 so days if we pass this. Nimble. There'll be 44 days okay. with, where the public could uh, petition against it. Um, okay. But, I mean, and just in the sense of trying to make sure that we're, we're on parallel tracks here, that yeah. I don't want it to be a good idea. really difficult to make changes in either The cases. attorney did... You know, we had discussed maybe making this more broad and just right. saying that we expect um, uh, permit holders to comply with right. all local ordinances, but the attorney and, and, and Frank and David all counseled us to be as specific as possible. Okay. Okay. I think it was our vision that we would work sort of hand in glove okay. with, with our Good. regulatory. Good. Yeah, because this is actually, and so this didn't go by the Planning Commission, so we haven't seen it. So I don't know if they'll... Well, now you have them. Please take it. I will be glad to do that. <laughs> please take it to your commission. Yes. It might be helpful. Yeah. It, just along those lines, so, but if you had a different ordinance for the zoning at a larger scale, that doesn't necessarily mean that it also couldn't be different in this document, right? Like if it was more lenient... Ours, but I think over... Right, right, right. 
But that's, that's what I'm saying is that if this is the document that is chosen, then you could still have a different zoning regulation and this would just supersede that at a more local level. We wouldn't want that to happen, though. Right. No. That, okay. would, that would just cause confusion. Yeah. Well, I, I guess my thought is just that you might, you might actually want matter, that for more right? rural properties versus more Well, the, well the, town, dense. the town is a different situation than the village. We're two separate municipalities, although we're also one town. Wait, I, I'm just saying I can see an instance where you would want the two to be different. Potentially. Yes. Well, they, are. They, they are. are. And they, they are, are. And they are right now, yeah. actually. As it exists in, in, uh, in planning and zoning, in the zoning laws right now, there are differences between the village and the town mm -hmm. concerning short-term rentals. Yeah. But between the village ordinance that we're proposing and the village regulations, I can't think of any differences. I think ours might be more detailed, yeah, but right. I don't think there are yeah. any differences right. between the village. They're not contradicting each town, other at all. There are at this time, right. right. That's correct. Right, but, but I'm just saying if there was a new zoning regulation that said 12 days plus unlimited foliage, and I, we. I think that we would all have to work very hard to. We'd have to work together, okay. and we probably, you know, we'd have to work that out together, and we would have a say in that. Uh, we'd say that contradicts. The ordinance that we, uh, I don't, I'm not saying it would, but yeah. if it did, and we thought this, the ordinance as it stands is better, we would continue with the ordinance as it stands instead of approving the, the change. Okay. Yeah. And so, so, and then our, our compliance officer, who we're so happy is taking this on. <laughs> <laughs> did he just arrive? Has arrived, hoping that all the questions are already answered and none will be directed to No, I'm kidding. Welcome, David. Yes, Mary. So um, I'm just want to get a little <coughs> clarification. So if somebody keeps <coughs> abusing the system and you keep slapping them with fines, the <coughs> ultimate thing is to take them to civil court, to superior court. Well. You can't shut them down, right? You can't legally, like, I guess what I'm, you, you're basically, it's a monetary thing. You can't literally, like, have the police go in there and, well, at $800 a day, if it really comes to it, and they're fighting it, and they're continuing, they'd be having to charge an awful lot for the short-term rental for them to be making a profit. Uh, you know, I, I just don't see that arising, given the teeth that this has. Well, and also Section X, uh, Part B, after the fourth offense, it also says there's a revocation of the yeah, and then, and then license. And they lose their ability to do it at all. That's right. If they continue to do it, they do lose their ability to So to those who uh, so yes. lose their legal ability to do it was never left to prevent them from doing it. Excuse me? So it, they, they would lose their, um, their license. They would lose their ability to rent at all, but and they, they would have to wait till the following, uh, they'd have to wait till another uh, regulatory period to, to apply for reinstatement. But um, are short-term renters now, aren't they um, renting without a license to do so. Once you like, do seven or eight or ten or twenty, you don't have a, a license to do that, but they're still doing it. That's so, what's happening now. Yeah. Right. But so how, what, what is what's different? How is the enforcement different with the if you can go to court and get an injunction. Right. Yes. And you still even after you lose the license you still have the eight hundred a debt. <coughs> so you lose your license but then you're still getting the fine right. aggregate. Yeah. So, so it's uh, court. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's got teeth. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's great. Just out of care, have you guys considered a process for, because this does change the requirements about owners who are far away and things like that, have you thought about a notification process just so people know they're in violation of a new ordinance? Um, so with their permit, they're... Well, they're, you know, they're required to have the permit. We are going to have to do a good job of getting the word out of exactly what's necessary. So, um, and all of those people who we are aware of We'll get letters. Now, those who are doing it and we're not aware of them, and we're just going to do our best to make it public knowledge that uh, this is a new ordinance that they, if they decide to do short term rentals, they fall under and must comply with. Other questions? You guys came in late. Yeah, I'm sorry, it looked like short-term rental was coming up much later in the meeting.
Well, uh, voting on it will come up much later. Uh -huh. this, this is the public uh, meeting, especially about, about input or questions regarding it. And anybody who's welcome to stay for the, uh, our meeting, uh, which begins at 7 o'clock, our regular trustees meeting. So are you looking for, I'm sorry, may I speak? You may. Uh, are you looking for input as to whether or not, just having briefly looked at this, it seems appropriate? Well, yes, we're looking for public input. We've had quite a bit of it yeah. so far in the last half hour, and we're, we're, we're still taking it. So yes, whatever you have to say, we're, we're listening. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, just uh, off the top of my head, residential neighborhoods, uh, short-term rentals presents a threat to the public welfare seems over the top. And that's a threat. I think that it's a public, uh, they, they serve a public benefit, if anything. I mean, they bring a... So I think they were talking about unregulated short-term rentals. So if it hasn't gone through the permitting process, the fire chief hasn't, hasn't been there. So the intention of this ordinance is to make sure that everybody has a permit. Can I finish? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> unregulated is the the operative word here. I think what we should be focusing on is how to regulate it and how to get some support for Michael Brands. I think from all of the meetings that I've listened to, for this to fall upon the shoulders of the zoning department with just two people in it is something none of us have the right to ask. And what we ought to be focusing on is how to regulate it appropriately, what outside firms we can bring in that we can afford and are sustainable uh, to support Michael and the zoning department because there is no way all of this work can be done by one person. So just to address that, because you missed the beginning of the I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry, it's okay. I'm just trying to answer your question. Um, for one thing, this primarily does not fall under zoning. Although the zoning officer, our zoning officer can be one of the compliance officers, primarily we have brought uh, in uh, our fire chief, David Green, as a right. primary and compliance officer. Regulation of this will go through our offices, our administrative offices, not through the zoning department. Okay. Um, and so um, it's not all falling under. Well, then I would amend that statement to the any office within the town of Woodstock right now. I think it's an onerous job, is what I'm trying to say. I think it's an enormous job, and that our town would be best served not trying to limit short-term rental opportunities, but trying to support the staff of the town of Woodstock and get them the help that they need to regulate it. Okay, so let me just say that for one thing, we're not limiting short-term rental opportunities beyond how they already exist in terms of how often you can rent. There's no change. Um, and we've also talked about uh, how we would like to see how this plays out in the course of a year. And if we need to change things and hire a company to uh, assist, if it turns out to be too big a job, we'll react as soon as we find it's, it's, it's too big a problem. But we'd like to start out by getting regulation, by making, putting everyone on the same page, making sure all of these homes are safe, and making sure everyone is following the rules. And enforceable. That, and, 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 and have it be enforceable. Um, and there are basically a lot of the rules that already exist, the planning and zoning had created, but there's no, no following them. We can't even know who's, who's renting short-term rental currently. I think that's the, the real problem. And so problem. this, so creating uh, the, uh, the, the need to uh, file and to report yearly creates a big difference. And for those who don't do that and still rent short-term, the fines are substantial. They should be. And so I think that that deterrent is in there to try to get everybody on the same page. Let's all register. Well, forgive me, but I'm reacting from the last meeting that I was at, and I, I can barely keep all of the boards in this town straight, so I, I don't even really remember. This Jill, is only Jill. covering the village. Okay, so it was Sally Miller uh, running it. So what was I? What were Planning we? Okay, thank you. Um, and so we, there was a lot of talk about the, these hypotheticals where they thought major corporations were going to come in and buy up the housing in Woodstock and run, you know, long distance, uh, short term rentals. Um, and run the town into, you know, some level of depravity. And it, it, there's no, 
I did short term. I no longer do. I have no horse in this race other than as a realtor, and I can tell you it's impacting the real estate market dramatically. Um, there's no way you could get a staff to go in and turn these houses over. There's no major corporation that's going to come in and start buying up houses in Woodstock. What? This is, you know, this is something that is really helpful to people who need to supplement their income in order to make taxes. And with these, the talk around town that they're looking for something like $70 million to improve the educational system and the educational brick and mortar uh, in this town to undermine property values and therefore reduce our tax income in this town is really backwards. Well, Jennifer, I, I, I just don't see this as how, you know, it's a different issue you're talking about. Uh, I think it's all one now. So, well, if we could just like reemphasize that this doesn't change the current ordinance in, in terms of requirements. Right. It doesn't change what you're allowed to do. Just making it have teeth in an ordinance so we can enforce it if we have to. That's all it's really doing you because before we had nothing. We just had a, we just had regulations. But what, what's the teeth? Like how are you going to monitor? It's very difficult given the scope of what's happening. That's why we're saying this is a living and breathing ordinance. We can change it in a year if you, we want to. We can make it stricter if we want to. But for right now, we're not looking to really ruin anything. We're just trying to get a hold on it. Mm -hmm. And we're certainly looking at, you know, and have, have um, investigated commercial enforcement entities. But first, David feels like it's a reasonable task for, for him to undertake, and we'll reevaluate that as the year goes on. Right. So I'm yeah. glad he feels that way. I, I feel sorry for anyone that has to try to. It's definitely a big job. It's a big job. Yeah, and, it's a big and job. And Dave is not the only one who would be involved in, in uh, the enforcement process as well. So. And perhaps when people find out that this is what's happening, they'll actually become compliant. They ought to. Just on the fact of the punishments are, are large, as large as we can actually make them. Mm -hmm. And not registering um, at all, we're, we're the punishment uh, is the maximum the state allows if, we, if, if David wants to pursue it. David would also have the leeway to, to uh, use his judgment if someone did something and, you know, he doesn't, he's not going to necessarily charge the maximum uh, for a fine. Uh, or he might even waive it the first time. I mean, we're going to use some judgment here. And people can come to us and also say, you know what, we, we want to uh, have a short-term rental and there's an occasion coming up where there's going to be uh, two extra people than what the regulations say. We're going, to, we're going to say, if it makes sense, we're going to say, okay. So we're, we don't want it to be too strict in either direction um, without taking, you know, people's circumstances, reasonable circumstances, into account at the same time. Well, I can tell you, having done it in the past, the, the problem becomes um, booking. When you book, when you're allowed six visits, which I think is reasonable, Sometimes you get the sixth, and before you cut it off, you get the seventh. So there has to be some judgment and some leeway. Um, because if you cancel that seventh one or call them up and say you can't come, you no longer are a super host, and your rating goes down. OK, well, that's good to know. Yeah. That's good to know. And that might be a circumstance where someone comes to us and says, that's exactly what happened. Can we have one exception? Yeah. And then this board can decide. I can't imagine we wouldn't say yes if they haven't been a habitual offender. The guests are also rated, and you can, you know, only ask for five-star guests to come to your house. So I think a lot of the scare um, rhetoric that I've heard is um, not valid. But when I was doing it, I had nothing but, yeah, of course, there's, you know, everybody could, if you put a dozen people at Airbnb, there's going to be one bad story. But everybody that I ever had, it was abs an absolute joy. I would have had them for free. Well, that's great. That's what we <coughs> hope for. Yeah. It also attracts a millennial group that we don't have coming to this town without 
short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't want to get rid of short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. We don't want to get rid of the millennials. No, no we don't. No, we don't. I'm sorry. No, no. No. Yes, Mary. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you guys say that you don't want to get rid of um, short-term rentals because I also, there seems to be this um, uh, connecting affordable housing and short-term rental. I think those are two entirely different subjects. And I think it's great what you guys have done. I think this is really moving forward um, because we want to have a clean act here when we have short-term rentals. And I think most of the people actually that I know do it do a really good job. And that's why people keep coming back. Because when it's not done well, people don't come back. And I think another good point that Jennifer pointed out is it's a good uh, revenue, you know, tax revenue. And let's face it, we have very high property taxes. It's very hard for people to afford. Mm -hmm. um, and if this allows people to be able to afford a property and be creative and do this, because it's not easy work doing a short-term rental. Oh, I've oh. never done it, but I've known people who've done it. It's I've you never really, yeah, to make a lot of money. It's really, it's just basically they're covering yeah. some expenses like property taxes or whatever, or to be able to keep their home. So um, those are my comments. But again, I think you guys have done a good job. And again, nothing can be, you know, you just have to test it. And as you said, if you can come back in a year and correct it, I think that's great because it is a all new to everybody, you know, how this business is growing, but I'm glad to hear that you're not, you know, want to eliminate it. No, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, in a year, we'd like to have it again, the public input. Yep. Not just us deciding how it's worked. Good. So last year, but how the public has received it. Um, and of course, and at that particular point, we will get David to say more than he's saying tonight. Um, because he'll have the experience of a year of uh, being a, a primary compliance officer, and, and he'll be able to say how it's been working from that yeah. perspective. That exactly. We don't know yet. Yep. Yes, up in the back. Yes, Elizabeth. Bridget M. Rose. I have a short term rental, and I've been doing it for about seven, eight years. And since I've started, things have changed a lot with Airbnb, VRBO Home Away, drastically where they are asking for so many fees from us, taking away the revenue that people are counting for to pay their taxes. And it's becoming to a point where the number of rentals you ask us to stick to does not make sense for anyone. Depending on the, depending on the rate you have per night, does not make sense. And with HomeAway, BRBO, and Airbnb, we, homeowners, have no longer the choice of who comes in because of instant booking. Instant booking allows anyone, unless you have specific rules, but it's difficult to put rules because you limit the possibility of people coming to your place. So the number of bookings that you may get through a year, if it's two nights a year, uh, two, nights a, uh, two nights a booking, times the amount you allow us does not make sense. Bridget, where is your, where is your? Southwood Stock. Okay. This is just for the village. This is, we're talking. The village this is just the village. Well, I'm, I'm fine, yeah. okay. okay, but I'm talking with everybody else. That's fine. I'm you know, just, I'm concerned about everybody else because there's taxes to pay. There's people that I, I deal with real estate agents. One of the things that we would be listening to in a year would be from people who are running Airbnbs also, who say, you know, if they say that, you know, things have become so onerous in terms of new expenses mm -hmm. from the companies that they're working through, maybe we will add time to it. But we, we'll need to hear that after a year. We need to go with the regulations as they currently exist in terms of how much time you're allowed. It's just and, it, and this is in the village. Yeah, yeah but so I've been coming come to those it. meetings for not every meeting, but it seems like it's not moving anywhere, like it's not going well, this anywhere. Is, this is a movement in the village, okay? Mm -hmm. The town is working through the, the planning and zoning. And, and so that's where your comments are best addressed. Although anyone in the village who has a position similar to yours and is, can come to us, we, we will listen and maybe after a year under our belt we'll say, Change things. I'm sorry to be a dead horse, but I think a lot of people are making points relating to the number of nights and the ordinance as it stands in terms of uh, 
requirements for number of stays. And I think it's really important to remember this isn't changing anything about that. Like this is identical no, to but the- No, what, what Rich is saying is that they are currently too oh. limiting as it is. Oh, no, no, I understand that. But I'm just saying that, that this, what you're taking under consideration here, if you were to pass it, it doesn't reduce nights. It right. does, it, if anything, it just makes it so that maybe when more people are required to adhere to these things, some of those difficulties will come to bear and then it gets edited later. But I think of what Thank Bridget you. is bringing up is that what our ordinance is not changing, but the, what, what, what the requirements of those people renting has gotten so expensive uh -huh. that the original regulations that we are matching we now are no longer <laughs> functional. Yeah. So well, it, that is, a, is something to be taken into but, consideration. But, but I think and you could make the argument that this will reveal that. You know, yes, because as exactly. people have to pay these fees, they'll say yes. this, it, yeah. Yes, as we do this process and as people who are running Airbnbs as a business, or STRs uh, rather, um, well, you know, let's find out how it, how it works. And if it finds out it's, it doesn't work for them and it's reasonable to increase the number of times they're, they're allowed, we will take that into consideration and we can make that change. Yeah, pretty, um, yeah, Jeff, I have two rentals that I do within the village of Woodstock. Um, I've been doing the one at the salon for about eight years now and the one at our house for about four years now. And I agree with what Bridget is saying completely, which is that it makes it difficult with the regulations that you guys are applying upon us as far as how many times that we can rent per year or per calendar year. Um, every tenant that we've ever had has been absolutely incredible. There's never been one problem. There's never been any noise issues, nothing. So I don't really understand why we're having a limit as to how many times per year we can rent. I think there's a balance um, and um, to your point of view and the point of view of others in the community who um, don't want to see an increase um, in uh, short-term rentals. And so we're trying what to... What is the increase, though, that they don't want to see? Well, in terms of the, the total number, there, there's been a, a big increase of unregulated short-term rentals in the village. Okay, I'm completely regulated 100%. I believe you are. We're not talking about someone such as yourself who's following all the rules. Uh, but we want to get a handle, have it spend a year getting a handle on regulating this, finding out how many there are and so forth. And then, and then we're open to hearing how it's working or not working from both sides, okay. both, both points of view. Okay. Sally? And I would just like to sort of extend that in, in terms of what the Planning Commission is doing. And one reason why we are struggling is because we don't know how many are out there. And these right, unregulated properties are really it's, it's difficult to know what impact they have on the community because we don't know how many they are. So this is great that if we can really get a handle on it in the village and hopefully in the town we'll be, we're going to come up with some kind of solution and we're working hard to try to get more data so that we can really understand the impact. Um, and as you say, it is a balance and it's a balance of knowing how many properties are being used as short-term rentals. Are they taking properties off the market? We just don't know. And so that's one of the struggles that we've had. And we're, we're trying to we're trying to get the data and working hard on that. Harry, uh, so I'm an innkeeper, and I think that there should be short-term rental availability uh, in the town. Um, I'd heard, although I hadn't been able to research it yet, that there is um, there had been studies, and there is you spoke to balance. There is a kind of optimal balance of uh, residences, uh, conventional hospitality, short-term rentals. And I think we're, we don't know what that is, but this is, in one way, trying to achieve it. Um, I think, uh, I'm also an engineer, so I, I think the numbers. And, and when I do hear that um, uh, kind of concerns about how it affects the tax base, um, how it allows people to uh, pay their taxes, uh, six rentals, six two-night rentals, call it on average $200 a night, it's $2,400. I'm not sure that really makes the difference between someone being able to well, pay and, and their foliage, taxes or not. During foliage, don't forget. That's during foliage, right, right, right. I'm unlimited on top of this. Right. If and it's owner-occupied. Uh, owner-occupied. Owner-occupied, and, and it seems like that's when 
the whole thing started, the earliest regulations were, were just that. It was owner-occupied, somebody, you know, the kids are gone, you rent a room out, and that was different. And I think the reason we've got to talk about this now is because the whole environment is, is different than it used to be. And then lastly, this, it, it's not about, um, uh, you know, there are very good um, short-term rental uh, owners and, and many of the, most of the guests are, are very good. It's not always problematic. That's not what this is about. That's not why it's trying to be limited. The reason to limit it is, is um, there has been substantial evidence, um, both with the housing study what we see around the world uh, in other towns is that there are negative, some negative impacts to an excessive amount of short-term rentals. And, and this is uh, limiting the number, uh, at least to try to see what the extent of the problem is, is one way to, in some ways, control just kind of rampant, unregulated increase of short-term rentals. It's not about there being bad owners or bad uh, guests. Thank you. Uh, Bridget? Right yeah, there. I'm all about control. I love control. I love limitation of number of guests in all the rentals. But as a person, I travel. I get a chance to travel. I get the chance to get together with groups of friends, 10, 20, sometimes family, 20. And we look for places where there's lots of people, not like where there's lots of beds. And I'm sure all of you here has had a chance to travel on home away, VRBO and Airbnb, and we're very pleased that it was a possibility for you to make that happen. So think about all those people that are trying to get to Woodstock, are hoping to be here and enjoy themselves with other people. We need to offer that chance to those people. And I'm all about control. But all of you, including the board, we all traveled on Airbnb. And we all want Airbnb people to come here. Thank you. Could we just have like, a, a, a pretty clear understanding, though, that this isn't a debate of changing the regulation or not changing the regulation yes. because it's it, this ordinance is the same as the existing ordinance. It just enforces it with fines. And so nobody's debating changing it one way or another right now. Like that's not on the table. We want to, we want to continue to welcome people to, to properly run regulated as, as uh, short term rentals. But there's no change. Yeah, there are. No, there are. I did. And we know the Thank you. Well, I have absolutely no dog in the fight here. I, you know, just but but just in thinking of past marketing experience and so forth, it, it just seems to me you don't want to tie anything completely to whether it's Airbnb, which is global and everybody knows. But just but just being after you can analyze the data that you would get after a year to say that it is clear that Woodstock loves everybody as a marketing thing, that Woodstock wants everybody to be able to come to Woodstock and love it as much as we do. That's absolutely. Point. Abs absolutely. You know, you know that's, you're, that's, you're talking to awesome. a board with uh, a banker, uh, two, two retail uh, exactly. owners, uh, and, and a realtor. Yeah. And <laughs> so <laughs> as a positive, we want people to come to Woodstock and have a wonderful experience, and we're not trying to stop that at all. OK. Uh, I can just add, like... And, and anyone, now, let's go back to uh, someone who hasn't talked to quite as much. Thank you. Yeah. And we have just about five more minutes. I, I just want to add to that sentiment about wanting people to come to Woodstock. I think that each of these zoning, these very thoughtful regulations and planning and zoning discussions and this ordinance are all reasons over time why this village is what it is. Is that pe you've, we, people have taken the time to think this through and say, how can we protect what we have? What is being protected becomes what's attractive. So if we lose our balance, if we're not a residential village that's welcoming, 
we're at risk. So I'm in support of the zoning, the, these decisions that you are making, but also have been made prior to this, that these previous regulations existed and exist in the first place. Now we're talking about an enforcement tool. All of these, I think, and historical design review, all of these decisions that have been made by various boards create this beautiful whole of this village and this surrounding area that becomes what's attractive. So we shouldn't forget that. That we have something beautiful is being has been and is continuing to be created through thoughtful decision making like this. Now I wish what you just said was recorded. <laughs> and I hope is. Neil Allen oh sorry, <laughs> getting that down because that was just beautifully said. Um, very, very beautifully said. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I it's hard to <laughs> Yes it's hard. I think Sally had something to say. Well, the only, I just had a clarification, and we discussed this at the Planning Commission, that um, when you say six times per year, year, you're talking about six rental periods. So in the town, we actually have a two-night minimum stay that we've proposed, that, that you're not counting each night individually, but it's a rental period. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, Up to 29 be days. days. Yeah. It could be a number of days, so it's not like you. It's not like you're only renting it out six nights a year. So going back to what Barry just said, yeah, no, is it potentially could be some of them could yeah, be renting right, for a week, and right? That's, exactly. And that's one use, right? So, but we don't really. And if it's that's more not, than thirty days, it doesn't count. Right. If it's more than thirty days, it count. But my point is, is it could be substantially more than you know. Yeah. That that's, amount. That's that's true. Uh, all right. We'll take two more. Jennifer. A little problem with that, Sally, is that you could set up an Airbnb that people have to run their credit card every night. Right. So one person that's staying a week, they have to run their credit card seven times, and that would not... If they're only staying one night and that doesn't come under your radar of short-term rentals, I, I wouldn't do that. That's and my come point. and explain it. You just have to uh, come yeah, in and say Okay, so that, that's it. just neither here nor there. Okay. Specific, no, no, I, I, I'm I, not that, wait. H, um, short-term rental, six guests per total occupancy. Most of the short-term rental houses have a bunk room. I think that's unsupportable, uh, um, that it, it should be a case-by-case -case basis, and that the fire chief should make that determination on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, and I then, think that's, that falls under the, the place, the area where anyone who's in that specific circumstance and they want to rent for more people than are in here can, um, can, 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 can get a waiver. I'm just pointing at you, I think that might be a speed bump for you going forward. And then the other one is um, the J, ex, um, the short-term rentals from April uh, shall occur no more than six times, okay, after that, A. Um, the leaf foliage season is September 15th through October 21st. I believe that leaf foliage goes on longer than uh, October 21st. And if you extended that period out, the best way, in my opinion, to run within and be compliant as an Airbnb owner is to use your six times, your six unique visits, take advantage of the leaf foliage season, and then rent out long-term during the ski season. So if you elongated the leaf foliage season beyond October 21st, it would run right into the ski season and people would be able to make enough money to pay their taxes. Extend that so it runs right into ski season and then people would not do short-term rentals through the ski season, they would rent out long-term a month or three months or four months at a time and with the six unique visits, the they open season. Well, then they don't need. Uh, that's what. I, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Anything it doesn't count against you. Then, then it doesn't. Count count. So that's my whole point. So if you have the open season during foliage, the six unique, and then if short term, uh, if people rent out for long term during the ski season, that is the formula for making money, enough money to pay your taxes with renting out part of your home and not having to move out. We will take that under advisement. Thank Extend you. the foliage period. Last, last, absolute last, because we have to stop. Um, uh, any, it has to be from a village person. Sorry, Patrick. Patrick. So, I did just want to point out that it, a lot of people seem to be raising concerns who are saying that they're following the regulations now, and I think it's worth considering that 
if this enforcement creates instances where people who are breaking the regulations now have to become compliant, then supply in the town will reduce and you may able, actually be able to increase your rates. So right now, if you're getting 150 a night, 200 a night, if all of a sudden five or six rentals disappear because those owners start following the regulations, you may then be able to charge 300 whatever a night. So I mean, I think there's also an issue here where anybody who's breaking the regulations is creating a surplus supply in the town where if they have to start following them, it may actually increase demand and pricing for the people who are following the regulations. At any rate, thank you all for coming. Um, everyone is welcome to stay for the trustees' meeting, which will begin not exactly on time. There will be uh, time for anyone who wants to leave to go and anyone here who needs a bathroom break. So, thank you very much.